All right, this morning you take your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. Matthew chapter 6, verses 2 through 4, but I've got to confess it's going to be a little while before we get there. But be ready, that's where I'll need you to be uh, when it comes time. Are you happy to be here this morning? Say amen. amen. Good. Thankful for the freedom we have to worship here today, amen? Amen. You know, a lot uh, had to take place for us to have the freedoms we have. We are the great experiment, right? Nobody else has had what we have been blessed with all of these many, many years. Much blood had to be shed, and is still shed to preserve our freedoms. And we are very thankful for that. All kind of somewhat started in Boston, Massachusetts, didn't it? On uh, December 16th, 1773. I'd never put that together. That's my anniversary, not 1773, <laughs> but December 16th. It was there on that day that three ships had been sitting in port carrying large amounts of tea for the colonists. Tea that they had to pay a large tax in order to get off the boat. And yet they had no one in British Parliament at all to give them a voice on that tax. That has been known as taxation without representation. And it angered the colonists. Like taxes anger everybody. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Come on now, y'all get with me. You can laugh a little bit. It's okay. And thousands began to meet and discuss a revolt. And it was on December 16th that a large group of colonists boarded those ships and dumped the tea into the harbor. Altogether, if it was valued today, it would be worth millions of dollars in today's economy. And so naturally, Parliament got mad. I mean, you know, one group gets mad, then the other group gets mad. That sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Their response was swift and harsh with what was called the Coercive Acts. Those acts were designed to restrict the liberties of the colonists in a variety of ways that made the tax on the tea look like child's play. I mean, they really started coming after them. The colonists began calling them the Intolerable Acts. And I'm being very simplistic. I'm cutting corners. I know that. So you historians here, don't hold me to everything, okay? Don't hold me to perfection. Um... The colonists in April 1775 couldn't take any more. And that's when the Revolutionary War broke out, leading to the formation of the United States of America, a nation of freedom. The Tea Party, as it became known, was an act of revolt against British tyranny. We live in a world full of tyranny because we live in a world full of sin. Satan is a, like a puppet master. He's taking people that are blind, they don't know any better, and he stirs them up to be against God, to be against one another, longs to enslave the world. He's most certainly anti-freedom, unless, of course, he could take those freedoms and use them to enslave us as well, which he sometimes does that as well. So it's in the spirit of the original Tea Party in Boston that I propose we have a Tea Party of our own. No, not the political movement over the last decade. I, I know I'm not behind the curve that bad, okay? Okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm calling for a movement of faith by God's people. Uh, as Christians in the U.S., we have certain freedoms that we should consistently take advantage of that no one else hardly has, or else we're going to cause ourselves to lose them, and I fear we are dangerously close to that, very dangerously close to that. First of all, we have the freedom, in light of our child dedication today, to teach our children. We have the freedom to teach our children. Children, I mentioned the Hebrew Shema a while ago. For the Hebrew people, it would have been absolutely irresponsible to God, irresponsible to country, and irresponsible to family to not daily teach their children in the way of the Lord. Totally irresponsible. They couldn't fathom that. I mean, I've got to be honest with you. When I go, when I went to Israel and I saw all of the, the devout Israel Israelites there, the um, that, that would you know, do their bowing and saying their prayers and all of that. Uh, I had to admire them in a way that even though they didn't know Jesus, I knew their kids knew it. I knew their kids knew about God, Jehovah. They might not know about Jesus, but they know about a Messiah they believe to come, and they're very devoted to making sure their children know it. And we have the freedom to do the same thing. We have the freedom to make sure our children know all about Jesus, yet... Unfortunately, too many even Christian parents 
allow the government loan to teach their children, to give them their values, to show them the path for their life. Some are, some are coming to regret that decision as they realize that even in education, government tends to serve its own interests. We as believers have the freedom and the responsibility to teach our children biblical principles and biblical values. Who else is going to do it? I don't see anybody. And, and, and don't rely on paid youth ministers and paid pastors to do it because it's not their children. They're not daily with them in the home. We have that joy. We have that responsibility. We have that privilege. We have that freedom to teach our children. Yeah, we can send them to school, but we must prepare them to be ready to disarm the work of the evil one when they get home. We must make sure we talk with our children about school and don't just assume they're getting reading, writing, and arithmetic without some sort of social indoctrination because that's happening, and we know it. School has changed. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> From the days of the American Revolution to the early 1900s, the main tool used to teach the alphabet and reading was what, church? Do you know? Bible. The Bible. That's absolutely right. <laughs> Scripture is used daily in public schools. Today, right now, there is a man in Utah fighting to get Bible, the Bible out of schools because he says it's pornographic. He goes through all the Bible and looks at all these things that are sexual in any way or anything like that, says that's filth, that's pornography, and they have a law to try to keep things out of, that out of school, so he's trying to lump the Bible in with that and say, no more Bible. My, how far we have fallen. Whether biblical values are taught in schools or not is not the issue. I know some of you are going, well, we need to be teaching the Bible in school. We need to be praying in school. No, that's not the issue. The issue is whether we're praying and teaching the Bible at home. We have complete freedom and autonomy to teach children the Bible, and that's the only way they're going to survive this sinful world. They need to know Christ and be grounded in faith. We have the freedom to tell them about sin and how to reject and run from temptation and ungodliness. We have the freedom to teach them who they are, how they are made in God's image, how God made them male or female and has plans for them just as they are. That He loves them, wants to save them from their sin and wants to spend time with them every single day. We have the freedom to teach our children. We should not be abdicating that. We should be doing it. Second this morning, we have the freedom to engage others with the gospel. Now, as that goes up on the screen, you're starting to see where I'm getting tea from, and you can tell what the first letter of my last point is going to be today. We can engage others with the gospel, not just our children, but anyone willing to listen. We have not lost the freedom to tell people about Christ on the street. We have not lost that. We've been going through Galatians and examining the true gospel in the last few weeks. You know, we have the privilege and freedom to share it. It's always been our freedom since our founding. Patrick Henry once said, This great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the freedom to be bold with the gospel. Because God formed this nation to be bold with the gospel. That's our purpose. Last week we looked at Romans 1.16. Let's look at it again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We don't need to be ashamed. I mean, listen, people want to shame us for what we believe. People want us to clam up and be quiet and tell us we shouldn't have a right to say the things we have. They'll call it hate speech and all kinds of things. But we know the truth. We know it's the greatest words of love we could share with anybody. Amen? And if we love people, we will not back down. You say, but yeah, but we might offend them. Okay, let's sit back and try not to offend people. But how long does that person have in this world before they're standing face to face and have no Savior to save them? I would rather hurt somebody's feelings than to see them go to hell. I'd rather risk it. 
I'd rather risk the relationship in the here and now to try to hopefully secure an eternal one with them than to lose that. We have the power of God in us to share the gospel with others so they can be set free from condemnation as we have been. Jesus said in John 8, 36, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel is the power needed for salvation of lost souls. You know, just like the colonists, they went to war to, get, to gain their freedom. We need to do battle for lost souls. We need to see it as warfare. Using the powerful gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ to win them from the enemy into the camp of the Lord Jesus. We have the freedom to gauge others with the gospel. Then third this morning, we have the freedom to assist the needy in Jesus' name. To assist the needy in Jesus' name. That seems out of step with the other two. I'll explain why I'm including this as I go along. Uh, Satan is oppressing people. Can you see it in our world today? I mean, while everybody's blaming guns for problems, uh, for uh, people getting shot, I want you to understand, that is just a surface issue. The underlying issue is the same issue it is with everything else evil going on in the world. Satan oppresses people, brings them to a point of helplessness, a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness and fear, and that causes people to lash out. He's behind it all. He's the one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And it's in that spirit that we see things like that happening. He oppresses people. And the church is called to help people because the assistance we provide reveals the love of God. It gets people off of their situation and helps move them over to hope. Helps move them over because they see help. Helps move them over to love. You see what I'm saying? Helping people in need in Jesus' name disarms the work of Satan and reveals a God of love. As people become thankful to us, we can point them to Jesus. I know there could be a lot of need. And we can feel like we can't help everybody, and we can't. All right? But we can help some people. We can help those that are around us. We can help those we encounter. Under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I understand that. Who do we help? Well, first, I've said this many times, people in the church come first. We know that because 1 John 3, 17 says, Whoever has the world's good and sees his brother, and that means very clearly in context, brother in Christ, sees his brother need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? How can we prove that we love God if we're not willing to help one another when we need it? Thank you, men. Some of our men yesterday, I will not name names because I might not remember somebody that was there, but Deborah needed, her air conditioning unit went out. She needed a window unit moved from Tammy's house next door to her house. How many men showed up? Four? Four of our men showed up at 7 o'clock on a Saturday morning on July 4th weekend and put that air conditioning in place. Thank you, men. That's what I'm talking about. A willingness to be there, to help each other, to serve each other, to meet each other's needs. But then there's people who are poor, and we need to look out for them. And this is when I finally get to Matthew chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. Well, let's read that. And I'll read it just a little at a time and comment as I go along. Jesus says, so when you give to the poor, now let's just stop there, okay? Good Bible study. Let's, let's talk about good Bible study for just a second. Did Jesus say, so if you give to the poor? He did not. There is an assumption here. Jesus is saying, if you love the Lord, if you walk in the Lord, you give to the poor. Whether it be through the church and the offering plate in the church and we do things for people, whether it be you personally, really it should be both, Whatever it is, he says, when you give to the poor. Then he goes on and says, do not sound a trumpet before you. That seems foreign to us. As the hypocrites do in the streets and the streets so that they may be honored by men. They actually did that. <laughs> but basically what he's saying is, and this is where I think we get the phrase, don't do it tooting your own horn. <laughs> Making a big deal saying, look at what I'm about to do. 
Don't put money in there to help people when what you're really after is attention. Can God still help the people that are mine? Amen. Yes, he can. That's okay. But he's saying you're still not giving it with the right heart. You're wanting to be honored by men. And he says, truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. In other words, they get the honor of men, but not the honor of God. He goes on to say, but when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, now in, in, in our modern terms, in, in, in seeing that in English, I think we would go, okay, I, I just need to be so secretive about this that my left hand doesn't even know what my right hand's doing. I don't think that's at all what this is saying. I think what this is saying is, as you're walking up to the temple to give your alms, which is what this, for the poor, which is what this is talking about, and as you're walking along with other people, don't be talking to the person on your left or the person on your right telling them what you're about to give. Don't let the person on your left hand, don't let the person on your right hand know anything. You just walk in silence and you go and give. Just go do it. They don't need to know. He's saying don't sound a trumpet and don't talk to the people around you about what you're doing. Keep it between you and God. And he says in verse 4, so that your giving will be in secret. Again, he's assuming in verse 3, when you give, and here he's talking about giving again, and your father who sees what is done in secret rewards you. That's when you get the accolades of well done, good and faithful servant. Overall, our guiding principle in helping people is, is the golden rule. Matthew 7, 12, and everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. You ever been down and needed help from somebody? I think we all have at some point in time. Somebody had to step in and help us along our way somewhere along the way. Aren't you glad somebody was there for you? Don't you want somebody to be there for you someday if it ever happens again? Sure. Then that's part of our motivation for being there for those who are in need right now that are in our lives. Let's not give up on helping people simply because their needs are so great. God didn't give up on us when our sins were many. He showed great love for us and patience with us when we were in our need. Instead, let's exercise the freedom we have to assist the needy in Jesus' name. There was the Boston Tea Party back then. Of late, yes, there has been a modern Tea Party movement. And some people of modern times, I don't think they have any clue about the Boston Tea Party. All they know is the Tea Party that they've heard of over the last decade. And that's a shame. But that Tea Party movement was formed to establish and was established to expose political corruption and deceit in our government to protect, uh, to fight to protect the freedoms of our nation. And I think the three things that I have shared today are really the things that will do that. They spell T. I guess you picked up on that. I don't use acrostics very often, but I use one today. Those three things will work to expose sin in the world reveal Christ to be the truth the world needs and bring freedom from the wages of sin for those who respond in faith to the gospel. We have the freedom, calling, and responsibility to teach our children about God, to engage others with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to assist the needy in order to show them the love of God. Now these three things, and this is why the last one is there, these three things I believe are the primary avenues the church has for accomplishing its mission. Those three things, that's family, world, and help to anybody. Love of God shown to people. Those three things are our three main tools for reaching people for Christ. So I want us to thankfully exercise our God-given freedoms and fulfill the mission to which he has called us. I want us to have a tea party and overcome the tyranny of evil through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father God, I come to you this morning and I thank you for the freedoms you have given us. I thank you for the opportunities you give us. God, give us eyes to see those opportunities, hearts to engage in those opportunities, and the words from your Holy Spirit to share in every opportunity you give us. And help us to not just be verbal about our witness, but help us to have our hand out to help those who need it and to reveal the love of Christ. 
Lord, we've got so much difficulty and trouble in our country today. Things that most of us here in this room today never thought we'd see. And God, it all comes down to Satan. It all comes down to sin. And it all comes down to our need to step up and have a tea party. To be what you have called us to be. To come against Satan and his works. And to reveal the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, motivate us, encourage us, challenge us today to not just be good Americans, but to be good Christian Americans, not forsaking the opportunities you have given us in this great country which you have blessed us with. And we give you praise and we give you honor and glory, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.